welcome to today's SHARE class. I know you guys have been so excited for this class, uh, waiting for it to finally uh, get published. So I'm excited that you guys are here watching. Um, today, we are going to teach you how to make macrons. And, you know, these are such a loved cookie. Um, it is a light and airy uh, almond meringue cookie um, that most people buy in specialty bakeries and uh, have never thought about making them at home. I actually went years um, with never even trying them. And then fortunately, I had an amazing neighbor whose um, daughter loved making them and brought them over to me and they were just beautiful. And I'm like, why in the world have I not tried these? So I've been tackling these now um, and I thought that I would break it down for you today and show you all the little steps um, to achieve these great cookies. And here's the thing, um, they require such few ingredients, um, but they, they're infamous um, for being parsnickety and just um, a little bit difficult to make. And I have found that they're actually quite easy if you can just master a few of the techniques in making them. And I think then you'll make them over and over and over again and just have a ton of fun with them because you can fill them with just about any buttercream or any flavoring that you want. And truly that's the best part of these is flavoring them. I'm really happy that you guys are here today and I hope this tutorial um, will help make you a master in making the macron. Uh, it's pronounced in so many different ways. A lot of people call them macaroons. Um, that's actually a coconut cookie, macron. Um, you can roll your R if you want, as the French do, or just say macaron, uh, macaron. Um, and that's as simple as it can be um, in saying it. But what I'm going to do, there are several steps in this recipe. And like I said, they're not hard. Um, and what a lot of people don't like to do, what they like to do is actually jump in and just start the recipe from the get-go. What I'm going to suggest to you today is you watch this video from the start to the very end first. Then go back and prepare the steps as we prepare them. And then you get the full idea of what's involved and how long it's going to take. And today's cookie actually takes a couple of hours, can even take up to three hours. Um, it's not because it's hard, it's just we have to give um, some resting time and some cooling time in there. And so it's not something we've been able to do at the Pikes Peak Library just because of the length of the time of the class. Um, but so I don't forget what I want to share with you is please, please, please reach out to us at sharing life, love and food. On Instagram or Facebook and we'll get back to you with any questions you may have any issues that you come across please reach out to us we love helping you out okay so we're gonna get started the first thing um, we're gonna backtrack a little bit go toward the end of the recipe and get our cookie sheets out um, so you're gonna need just a couple of baking sheets I have two here and you're gonna line them with parchment paper now a lot of people in trying to achieve this pretty little cookie want a uniform cookie. And so what we'll do is we'll put online a template that you can use for the size of cookie that you want. Um, I'm going to make smaller ones today. I prefer just a bite size of these instead of the bigger um, one to two inch. But you can find the templates online pretty much anywhere. Um, but you'll just want to print off two sheets of the template. And then you take some tape, turn them over upside down. There we go. And just put some tape on them to get them to stick. And then you can slide it right underneath your white parchment paper. If you have the non bleach parchment paper, it's not gonna work because you won't be able to see through it. But this way, 
with the white parchment paper, you can get a template underneath there and you know the exact size. I don't really use a template. Um, I just try to make them precise as I go along. Um, but this is a trick that you can do to just help you as you're first starting out to make sure that they're all even. And then before you put them in the oven, you are gonna wanna pull out this template um, because this is on paper. Um, you can buy the templates too online. I, I don't necessarily think they're necessary, but you certainly can buy a template. Uh, but otherwise, print it yourself, slip it on underneath your parchment paper, and then just make sure you carefully pull out that template before you put these in the oven. So you have your parchment paper and cookie sheets ready to go. We're just going to set these to the side here. Um, the next thing you're going to want to do is make sure you've set out your eggs well in advance, okay? Um, we want these to be at room temperature. Typically, it takes about three eggs. Um, we're going to talk about that here in a second, determining how many eggs we actually need. But start with three and just make sure they're at room temperature. So I typically set out six um, just to be on the safe side, at most I need four, but depending on the size of your leg, eggs, you're looking for larger eggs. And um, we're going to start with three. So you want to set those out, like I said, to get to room temperature. With mac macarons, um, you only need a couple of the ingredients. You don't need a lot. The eggs, then you'll need to pick up some almond flour. flour. If you are so inclined, you can certainly make almond flour yourself. Um, I prefer the buying um, almond flour for macrons because you want the powder to be finely processed, as fine as you can get it. And um, that does make a difference in the texture of your batter. So I would recommend picking up that um, almond flour. And then, so those are our first two ingredients. Our next two ingredients are powdered sugar, and granulated sugar. And then you'll need a flavoring. We're using vanilla today. And then you'll need some cream of tartar. And then the next thing is, I'm gonna put this on the slide in the video. Um, you're gonna want some food coloring. Now, a lot of people in your pantry, you're gonna have the water-based um, food coloring. I would not recommend using that. Um, it's going to make your batter runny and we don't want to do that. Um, so this is a brand um, that's become super popular with making macrons. It's called American Color and they have the absolute most beautiful colors you can imagine. Um, today we're using um, some tones of brown, espresso and warm um, brown, those two colors. But if you want vibrant fuchsia or hot pink or orange or lime green, they have amazing, amazing colors and you just need a drop or two. So literally this will last you four years. You can buy it on Amazon, um, but I highly recommend it. You can, on the top, you'll see the different color variations that they offer. And I know I'm talking a lot pre-video before we jump into this. But again, I want you to have all of this before you jump in. So you have those ingredients, those very few ingredients that we need, those six things, um, plus your food coloring. You are gonna need a piping bag and a piping tip. So let me just grab those. Um, I have a, a, it's called a Teco. Um, they're brands, um, I have a lot of their stuff. I just opened a new piping bag this morning. It happens to be a 21, inch bag so it's pretty big and um, you don't need one this big I that's just half what I had on hand um the piping tip that I'm using is a round piping tip and this one has number 808 on it and it again is the same brand and I'll put that on uh, the video so you guys have that so you'll set that off to the side you're going to also need a sifter of some kind. It can be a handheld one that you just pat on the side or you can use the old fashioned one with the little turnstile. And you'll just wanna have a few small bowls handy. Um, we're gonna be separating our eggs. 
have a teaspoon and a measuring cup. One cup is what I have on hand and then just a larger spoon. Have that all handy and ready to go before you start. And you know, as there's a ton of you who are bakers out there. And as you know, over the years, as you, you bake more and more, a lot of it is sight and feel, right? As you go along and you um, ad lib and just kind of free flow um, recipes. This is a recipe you're going to want to follow to the absolute T. Um, anytime in a bakery, um, they're making something in mass over and over again, they measure every single thing by weight. And so what I'm going to suggest to you today is you actually purchase a scale. And this is a game changer in your baking. If you're making a lot of things, use a scale because that way you know it's going to come out every single time. There's no guess whether you've scooped the flour the right way and if it's too heavy, too light, too much, too little. With the scale, you'll know that it's perfection every single time. And making a Macron is all about precision. You can pick up a scale online, Amazon, for just a few dollars. Um, they're not expensive and they'll last. It, this will last you forever. So this is probably the most important thing to have. Even if a recipe tells you, oh, don't bother with the scale, you can certainly um, ignore the tip that I'm giving. Um, it just means you may not have that perfect little cookie. It might look a little off, um, be a little bumpy. Um, that's okay too. We're not necessarily about perfection. It's about taste. <laughs> you know, as a lot of you guys know, if you have young kids who've made cookies for the first time, you'll still eat it even if it doesn't look quite right. Your family's still going to eat these if they don't look perfect. Um, I'm just trying to show you how to make them as precise as possible. So this is my number one tip is have a baking scale. It will be worth it for all your baking from here on out that you get that exact measurement that you're looking for. So set that off to the side. Um, so to start off with, um, I'm using a uh, stand mixer today. You can use a regular bowl with a hand mixer as well. Um, we're using the here whisk attachment. I'm gonna put that on. And again, I know everyone's waiting for me to start this recipe, but I have yet another tip I wanna share with you. Double check that the bowl you're using, I try to be real careful not to put my fingers in it um, because the oil from your fingers can make a difference as you're whipping up egg whites. So try to make sure that bowl is extra clean. Um, if you wanna make double sure that it's extra clean, Grab some white vinegar on a paper towel and just wipe the inside of your bowl. And then you know 100% there's no oil marks from your fingers or any residual um, residue from you know some time prior where you used that bowl. Um, so that's a tip that you can use as well. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and separate our eggs. Um, I use a traditional method with separating eggs. Set my three out here and set these off to the side here. There's two ways you can do this. Um, you can crack them, put them in half shells, separate it. That's how I'm going to do it. Or you can drop your eggs in one bowl, reach in, lift out the yolks, and take them and put them in a, into another bowl. That works too. It depends on um, your comfort level with touching the eggs. I'm just gonna crack it down the middle, break it into half, and let all that egg white fall off of there. And then just gently transfer the yolk to the other side of the eggshell and just go back and forth until all the egg white has dripped down in there. I'm gonna transfer that egg yolk into this bowl. I like to save the egg yolks. Um, my One of my sons makes pudding all the time. Um, and he loves to use them for pudding, so I figured I might as well save them for that. So crack it in half, and then you just go back and forth, separating out all of the egg whites. There we 
go. And as I mentioned, we're looking for true precision here. Um, so right now I'm going to start with three egg whites. Um, we'll measure it out in just a second after I finish this process, going back and forth. Just make sure all that egg white gets in there. Okay. I'm going to set this off here to the side. Okay. So I grabbed another bowl and you'll want to take your scale and turn it on. And once you see the zeros come up, um, what you can do is set your empty bowl on top and now it's going to weigh it with the bowl on there. Now you can press the tear setting um, and it will clear it so it adds the weight of the bowl in. And what we're looking for with these three eggs is it's an easy number to remember. It's 100 grams. Double check on your scale that you are actually measuring um, in the unit of grams. So double check that you see a G on there. And so we're looking for 100 grams. So we can take this and pour it in until we reach 100. Keep going here. I'm at 96. There we go. And if you go a little bit over, it's not a problem. What you can do is grab a spoon. Grab a spoon here and I'm just gonna take out just barely any. I was at 102. There we go. I'm at 101. I'm just reaching. Eggs can be, you know, a little slippery there. I just find that using the spoon, you have a little bit more control over the weight that you get. So we're aiming for perfection of 100 grams, okay, for our egg whites. Once that's done, you can set that off to the side. And so now we're going to do the same thing with our next ingredient, which is the almond flour. And we are looking for 140 grams of the almond flour. And typically that's about a cup and a half. Just to give you an idea, that's why I have the cup measurement. Um, just to give you a general idea of how much it is. So you want to go ahead and clear your screen so it goes back to double zero. Put your bowl on top again, and it's gonna take into account the weight of your bowl, so go ahead and tear it. There we go, so it's at zero again. And then now we're just gonna go ahead and add in our flour. And we are aiming, like I said, for 140 grams. Again, it's about a cup and a half, so I went just a little bit over my cup measurement. I'm gonna put this in here. You guys, this precision piece is the hardest part really of the recipe. You just have to be precise and uh, takes a little bit of time to do this, but it's worth it to get all this done before you even start the recipe. I'm up to 120 grams. There we go. 128, so just a little bit more to go here and we will get to 140. And as you guys know, anyone who's watched all these videos we've put out onto the Pikes Peak Library TV YouTube channel, I like to show you from start to finish how long something takes. I try not to cut out too much other than our wait times if we're waiting for something to rise. Um, just because I want you to know the reality of how long this truly takes. I don't want there to be any surprises. Um, you know, I know we live in a TikTok world where everything is done. Um, super quickly and we think it's just gonna happen like that. Um, I like to show you the reality of it, the mess that you make and the time that's involved. All right, so we have reached our perfect 140 grams of almond flour. So we're gonna set that off to the side. I'm gonna dump this back in here. There we go. All right, and so now we need to measure out our sugar and our powdered sugar. So um, let's go ahead and measure out our 
on granulated sugar, we're going to need 90 grams of granulated sugar. So again, on your scale, make sure it's at zero, add your bowl, and it's going to weigh that. Then we want to hit the tear button and it will factor in the weight of that bowl. And let's go ahead and add in our 90 grams. And I'll use a larger spoon sometimes too um, to add that in to our bowl just to have more uh, control over how much is added. There we go. It's fun to use this too. So again, we're looking for 90 grams. I'll put all these measurements on the video so you guys know. There we go. So 90 grams of granulated sugar right here. And then the, lastly, we're going to want to get some powdered sugar. And we need 130 grams of powdered sugar. So again, I'll repeat myself. Um, just so you guys don't forget, when you're dealing with your scale, you want to get it back to the zero, add your bowl, and then hit tear, and then it will factor in the weight of your bowl. So you're back down to zero, and now we want to reach for that 130 grams of powdered sugar here. There we go, we're at 60, 100. And again, um, that spoon comes in handy just because you can sprinkle it on and perfect, we're at 130. Okay, so let's just backtrack really quick. We have 100 grams, about three large eggs, 100 grams of egg whites that are at room temperature. Again, super important. Um, we have our almond flour it's about a cup and a half, but our precision measurement is 140 grams of almond flour. We have 90 grams of granulated sugar. And then as far as the powdered sugar, we have 130 grams of powdered sugar. Okay, so have your vanilla ready, and then also have a quarter of a teaspoon, a fourth of a teaspoon of cream of tartar ready to go. When you're, after you've measured your almond flour and your powdered sugar, you can grab a bowl and a couple of sheets of parchment paper. And what you wanna do is go ahead and combine these two ingredients together by sifting them together. And you may wanna do this a couple of times. Um, it just helps make sure that everything's fully incorporated. So I add these to my sifter and just go ahead and sift them into a bowl here. And you can do it on parchment paper. Sometimes I'll lay down the parchment paper just in case um, I accidentally miss the bowl. I can easily add it back in. But go ahead and sift this. It just takes a second. If you find that you know you have a lot of crumbs at the bottom here, you can also run this through a food processor to make sure that it's super, super fine. You can also use a spoon and kind of crush those larger pieces of flour that may be stuck at the bottom of your sifter, and that can help get things through. You might end up with it about maybe a half a teaspoon of crumbs. And again, you can go ahead and use a spoon to press those little bumps out of there. But our goal is to try, like I said, for the precision effect, try to get all of that sifted out of there. And then you can run it back through. And like I said, if you spill any it's not a huge deal because the parchment paper is underneath. There we go. And you can easily pick it up. I use two pieces of parchment paper. That way it's still on a surface. When you remove the top sheet, 
you can carefully lift it up and just add it right back under there. And that's just a trick I've learned over the years because again, you're trying not to lose any of those precise measurements. And go ahead and sift it again. And just make sure that you stay right over that area to collect all of that powdered sugar and almond flour mixture. And again, we're just making sure that it's evenly combined and we've used up all of that. And so it's on the parchment paper all ready to go. You can set this off to the side. And I'll go ahead and move this over so it's out of our way for now. Go ahead and take your egg whites and add those to the bowl. And I just want to show you guys the overhead view here so you guys can really see this process. So we're just going to turn it up on low here. You guys can see it's on a tube and you can see the inside of the bowl it's that yellow clear turn it up just a little bit and as it spins you're going to see it start to turn foamy and that just means you're going to see lots and lots of bubbles form We'll turn it up just a little bit more to a six. I'd like to show this overhead view and I'd like you to see how the texture changes. You see all those bubbles down there and it's starting to form that foam. And that's your cue to add the fourth of a teaspoon of cream of tartar. There we go. Add that in. And now, oops, we're gonna turn that back on a medium speed. And, and you'll see that that foam now will start to build and turn a pure white color. I'm on the six right now. And I'm going to go ahead and see how it magically is changing colors right before our very eyes. And do you see how it's starting to build up? All those bubbles are disappearing. And it just looks like a cloud. So that mixture has pretty much doubled in size. It's turned a really beautiful white color there's not really any streaks of the egg white that you can see in the batter. I'm going to go ahead and keep going on this. Um, but now as it turns this white pillowy section, that's your cue. The soft stage is when you want to begin to add this 90 grams of granulated sugar. And you're just going to be adding it a little bit at a time. We don't want to deflate this by dumping it all in. It'll press out some of the air. So we want to just add it gradually. So I'll turn this back up to a six or an eight, somewhere in that range. Just do an eight. And then we'll just sprinkle in a little bit at a time. And all we're doing is dissolving the sugar as air is added to this. And you're going to start to see streaks form in the bowl. 
the lines form and it's just going to get richer and thicker as it spins. So now that we're in our final stages of getting super close to having st stiff peaks, that's when you want to add in your flavorings. So we're going to add in a teaspoon of vanilla. And then that's when you want to add in your food coloring. Uh, for today, we're just going for a really soft kind of rose color. So we're just going to drop in one drop of the Stark Espresso. And just, oop, see I got a little too much there. That's okay, it'll just be a little bit browner. And then we're going to do two drops of this lighter warm brown. And just be careful as you squeeze into here. There we go. One more squeeze. There we go. Now we can beat this until we reach that stiff peak stage. And as I mentioned, that batter will ball up into the center, and that's one of your clues that you've reached that stiff peak stage. And we'll take our bowl out here and just be able to show you, you know, that stiff peak. You can put it down in the batter, and your peaks don't move at all. It stays that stiff peak. So tap out any of your batter that's on your beater. We'll test it again. And again, this is, a lot of this is just trial and error. And do you see like our stiff peak, you can push it down into the batter, come up and it doesn't even move, right? That's the perfection that we're looking for with our stiff peak batter. And it's just a really soft, soft color. Um, maybe slightly pinkish, um, as I mentioned, and as it um, bakes and sits, it'll get a little bit richer in color. Um, but you can play around, like I said, with the different colorings. Um, you can make bright rainbow color. Um, most important thing is not to use water-based food coloring, which most of us have on hand, um, because it will deflate this meringue mixture. So go ahead and tap this batter back into your bowl off of the whisk attachment. Set that beater to the side. And then you can gently sprinkle in all of your dry ingredients into your bowl. Make sure you have that spatula handy. And I'll show you this overhead view. You carefully grab your dry ingredients that we put on the parchment paper and we'll sprinkle that over the top really gently. And then when you set it down, just make sure you grab the end of your parchment paper and scoop up your parchment, all the dry ingredients in there so it doesn't fall over on the side. And with your spatula, you're going to draw a straight line down, turn your hand so it lays perpendicular to your spatula, swoop it up and around to finish off making our D shape, then it's going to spin around. So we go back to straight up and down. I hope that makes sense. Draw a line down with your spatula so it's straight up and down, turn it so it goes flat, draw that D, and then turn it straight up and down and go down again. That's all we're doing with this mixture. We're gonna draw a line down in our batter, come up the sides, turn it over. We're gonna go down the center and then flip it over and make that D shape. And I think this angle helps 
with showing you what I'm doing. I'm going down the center and then around. Around the center and around. And we're just incorporating those dry ingredients in. And once you see that they're almost gone, go ahead and grab your parchment paper. Sprinkle in a little bit more. Like I said, I don't dump it, I just sprinkle. Go down the center and continue to turn. Go down the center, kind of scrape the edge of your bowl. Down the center, I go around sometimes, go back down the center and make that D shape. There you go, and when it's almost disappeared, Grab the rest of your dry ingredients and sprinkle the rest of your dry ingredients in and over the batter. There you go. And if you see any batter on the sides of your bowl, go ahead and scrape that. But you can go down the center and then turn it over. And I just think of that shape as a D. Go down the center, keep turning and folding in those dry ingredients. And you'll slowly start to see the dry ingredients incorporate and your batter is going to be really thick. Just remember to reach the bottom of your spatula all the way down to the bottom of your bowl. and continue to go down into the center and then fold over. Down into the center and fold over. And then just keep grabbing it and you're gonna see that it's pretty thick and your hand might even get a little tired doing this. But look how thick this is. It won't even come up of the spatula. Once you see all the flour mixture has gotten incorporated in there, then we move to another technique, which is called macronage. And all that means is now the macronage stage is when we try to get the batter into a fluid ribbon flowing type batter. If you watch any, you know, anyone else online, they'll describe it as this lava flowing batter. I don't like to use that term because most people don't ever see lava. Um, just think of a free-flowing batter that actually falls off your spatula. That's what we're going to be looking for. Um, a technique of the macronage is to take the batter and we're going to be releasing the air bubbles um, by pressing the batter up against the side of the bowl. And that you're going to push it out the bubbles. Push the batter to the side, release those bubbles, and go ahead and spin it. And again, we are using that, that shape, the D motion of dragging it through, but you can now press the batter up against the side of your bowl, as you guys can see here. You press it up and you'll start to see your batter kind of loosen up and you can lift your spatula up and you can see those ribbons of batter start to form. And all we're doing is pressing those air bubbles out and you'll start to see air bubbles pop everywhere throughout your batter. And you can press down and you'll see all those holes all throughout your batter everywhere, holes, and all those holes are, are air. And again, all this takes is just some practice and you'll start to, if you pay really close attention to the batter, you'll start to recognize all these different stages. And as you press down, the less holes you see in the batter, the closer you are to being to that stage where your batter is just gonna free flow off of your spatula. If it's super thick, 
you're not quite there. You gotta keep going. A lot of people, you know, I've counted this. Sometimes it's 40, sometimes it's 50 turns. I can, I really like to learn to go by sight because everyone uses a different shape spatula, a different size bowl, a different amount of pressure as they're pressing, pressing out. So see how I push down against the side of the bowl, the batter, and that's that macronage that's pressing out any of the air bubbles. So let's see, they, a lot of times they'll say that you can make a figure eight with the batter once it starts to free flow. So I'm gonna keep turning this. Let's see if I can get my figure eight. And I just made a figure eight with the batter. So you're gonna know that you're at the right consistency when you can reach and grab your batter and have it flow from your spatula and you can draw with the batter the shape of an eight. So see how it flows nice and loosely and we just made that eight shape with the batter. That's how you're gonna know you're, you've reached that perfect consistency. And you'll not really see any holes anymore and it'll just be a nice, smooth, thick, um, rich batter, but it that has some movement to it. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab our baking sheets and have those all ready to go. Scooch that off to the side here. And again, feel free to use a template and place that underneath. and just make sure that you can uh, reach it and to pull it out before you place it into the oven. So now you can grab your piping bag. Again, I have an oversized one. Don't worry about having an oversized one. Um, I just happen to have bigger ones because I tend to make a lot at one time. Um, again, you don't need this large of a piping bag, but have a piping bag ready to go. Um, I always set it in a glass. So that way I don't have to have someone here helping me hold this. Um, I have a round tip. Um, this one happens to be um, a Teco 808. And what you're gonna wanna do is drop it into the bottom of your bag. So it's right there flush at the end. And then what you wanna do is twist. Why are we twisting this? Well, because if you don't twist it, then when you drop your batter in, it's just gonna fall out the other end. So that's just a little trick. Twist it just a bit so your batter is not just going to plop out of there. And you're gonna take your batter and just using your spatula, go ahead and drop it down into your piping bag. go scrape as much out as you can there we go and use your spatula to get every last bit of batter out of there and you guys can see just in that short amount of time that pretty soft pinkish color that we've gotten with that food coloring. It's just a super pretty, pretty color that you wouldn't get from using any other type of food coloring. It's really my favorite part is just exploring with all the different colors and you can wipe your um, batter off on the side of your piping bag there. And then set your bowl and spatula off to the side. Now, to get started, like I told you, um, I'm gonna make the smaller ones. I'm not gonna make the bigger ones. You can practice making the bigger ones. Um, I just find that when you first learn making smaller ones, it's just a little bit easier. 
we're going to be folding up the top of this piping bag and applying pressure from the top of the bag, not the bottom. This hand is just gonna be there as a guide and you're going to gently press, you'll see it come out and you'll go to the edge of your circle of your diagram underneath your template and then you're gonna stop piping. You're gonna go around in a circle motion and let go and pull it away. And don't worry if you have a peak form, we'll worry about those later at the end. Um, we'll press those out of there. Um, but that part is important. Try to stay 90 degrees up and down as you're piping these out. Try not to turn your arm this way or that direction. So I'm gonna unfold my bag here. And I'll just say it again. Um, you do not use, need to use this large of a piping bag. This one happens to be 20 inches, uh, 21 inches. It's just what I happen to have on hand today. Um, but what I do is I fold in. I like to work with the larger ones because then I don't have to keep adding to it and making a huge mess. And at the end, remember how we twisted? Go ahead and untwist it. And as you fold down the top of your bag, see I fold it in on the sides, one, fold in one side, kind of straighten out your bag, fold in the other side, and then I fold the top down, and then I just keep folding until I see it align with the edge of the batter, and my batter starts right about there. And you'll see if you press, on it, then it's going to come out the bottom and we don't want that to happen because then you'll make a huge mess. So you'll see it start to come out, put it right over your template and keep it straight up and down, apply just a little bit of pressure, go around in a circle and you can lift up. Go to the next one, a little bit of pressure. And again, you can press down and then do a circle little bit of pressure. You don't have to move it around just until it reaches the edge of your template. And then you're going to spin your hand around. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see that we're going 90 degrees. We're applying with my right hand, just a little bit of pressure. So the batter flows out. I'm not moving around in a circle at all. And now at the very end, I make a round motion. A circle motion so go straight up and down gently push and when I say gently you'll barely have to push that batter out and you can kind of push it down till it reaches the edge of your template go around in a circle and you go to the next one and you just keep going just like that um, I'm gonna go ahead and finish this um, I'll put it on a fast speed so you guys don't have to sit here and watch me pipe over and over again. Um, but this way you have a general idea. You're just holding it straight up and down, applying a little bit of pressure with your right hand, just a little teeny tiny bit of pressure. It will naturally flow out of there. And then you make a circle to finish it and it will drop off of the edge of your tip. So we'll do it one last time here. Hold it up above here. We're not moving it. We're just letting it gently come out of there. We're applying a pressure with our right hand till it reaches, reaches the edge of your template. Then you make a circle. And if you get a large peak like that, it's okay. Um, at the end of this, we'll come back with a toothpick and press those down. Okay, so we are at our final row of the Macrons um, and our template here. So I did the fast forward motion just so you guys could see kind of it's a patient process. And again, you're going straight up and down at the very end, right when it comes to the edge of the size of your template, you'll make a circle quickly and you're pressing with your right hand your left hand is there just to stabilize it. There we go. 
and you press squeeze down till it reaches close to the edge and then you make a circle with your hand just like that and then you can turn it upright and just remember make sure you get that template out of i'm going to use the edge of the bowl there hold your parchment paper and then gently reach in and pull out your template and you can put that on your other baking sheet here and you can have that and what you want to do is go ahead and we want to make sure that all the air bubbles are out of here so you can tap this on the edge of your counter you can go underneath of it and just hit all the rows on here and we're basically trying to pop out any of those bubbles that may have formed and go ahead and tap down on your counter and you can look at the tops of your macrons and if you see any air bubbles go ahead and grab a toothpick and you can take the toothpick and just pop it and smooth that out and as you guys can see as you pipe if you got that peak on there by the time you tap all this down your peaks will be gone okay and sometimes if you accidentally get some extra batter you know elsewhere on your parchment paper you can always use this toothpick um, to wipe that off but if you want your macrons to have that nice pretty top um, you can pop these air bubbles or press down any of those peaks that might still be standing and this can take a minute or so um, go ahead and pop those out again I'm not overly um, picky because I think people just appreciate eating these mac macarons um, as opposed to making sure that they look 100% perfect. But you know, you can certainly spend a lot of time just making sure everything looks super smooth and perfect and popping out all those bubbles. Or like me, if you're okay with just a little bit of imperfections here and there, um, you can keep moving on. And again, you can use the side of your toothpick to kind of smooth things out just a little bit. And another trick is you can wet your finger. So I'm going to add some water to this. Add some water to this bowl. You can dip your finger in, shake off any extra water. Anything that does have a tip, you can go back through and just gently press down. We're not pressing too hard because we don't want to deflate our um, cookie. There we go. And you'll see that just by wetting your finger there, it'll smooth everything out. There we go. And you'll see it's kind of like magic how that works and if you find that your finger sticks then dip it back into the water but don't put too much water on your finger but that trick is super super helpful because no one ever tells us that trick and i'm always surprised by that so sharing that little tip with you guys if you want those smooth perfect tops that's a trick to do so there we have it our um really pretty uniform macarons and we're just doing the small ones because I think bite size are so fun and you get more out of them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start on this second cookie sheet just to use up the rest of my batter here. But what you're going to want to do is set this off to the side. I usually put them over on my um, stove 
and we're going to let these rest for about 40 minutes. Um, we're so lucky here in Colorado because we have very little humidity in the air. So what we're doing is letting the tops of these dry out. And what happens is a skin forms over the top. And that's what's going to make that pretty smooth surface that we so like in these Macrons um, in the finished product. So go ahead and take your cookie sheet, set it, set it off to the side. You can set a timer. I mean, sometimes it can take as little as 20 minutes. I'm here in Colorado. I usually go ahead and I'm patient and I wait the full 40 minutes um, for that nice skin to form over the top. And you'll see if you right now with our wet finger, when you press on it, it's sticky and tacky. After those 40 minutes, you'll be able to touch it with your finger and it won't indent, it won't move anything. It'll be nice and firm. So that piece is important. So we're back. Um, our 40 minutes of being patient, waiting for those skins to form is almost up. So go ahead and make sure that your oven is at 300 degrees. One tip that you may want to do is buy an oven thermometer and place it inside your oven and just double check that when you press 300 on the outside that the inside is also 300, oops, that the inside is also 300. Um, that way you know that your oven is 100% accurate and you know that it's not your oven's fault if these don't work out. Okay, so that's just another tip that we can add in there. Okay, so our timer is about ready to go off for our 40 minutes. I'm gonna grab our baking sheets and you guys can take a look at how pretty those are. And what you can do is take your middle finger, yeah, rub them across the top and you'll be able to feel that they're 100% dry. You can't even press on them, completely dry on the top. Just go ahead and place them into the oven. Because we're making smaller ones, we're only gonna put them in for about seven minutes at 300 degrees. If you're making the full two inch um, standard size cookie, um, typically it's about 12 minutes um, for the baking time, but for the smaller one inch cookies, um, it's about seven minutes. So we will go ahead and um, put this in the oven for seven minutes. Um, I want to remind you to go ahead and make sure that you have butter out, one stick of butter. Um, we're gonna want that to be at room temperature if at all possible. Um, if not, you can mix it a little longer in your mixer to get it nice and um, smooth and soft, but it's much easier if it's at room temperature. So go ahead and um, set that out. And then you're also going to want some powdered sugar. Um, if we're back to our precision measurements, you're going to want 113 grams of butter. You're going to want a 180 grams of powdered sugar. Today for just like I told you for this buttercream, you could be basic and just add plain buttercream. Um, but what's fun is to add in some flavoring. I think that's what makes a Macron extra special. Today I thought we would make salted caramel um, buttercream. So I'm gonna be adding in 60 grams. So we'll wanna measure that on our scale of salted caramel. And oftentimes I make this from scratch. If you don't want to, you can certainly buy uh, salted caramel at the store and just weigh that out to make sure you have the exact amount and then you know it's going to come out. It's going to be the right thickness and the right texture that you're looking for. Um, one of the tricks during the seven minutes um, of baking time, you can put on your oven light and it's a fun process to watch. They went in as flat cookies and as you see them rise, you'll see this, what's called a foot on the bottom of the Macron form. And it, you want the air to rise up and not 
out. So these cookies aren't going to spread outwards, they're going to rise up. And that's all because of the air that was in the egg whites. So it's actually super fun for kids or yourself to just watch this baking process. You're going to stand here for about seven minutes, um, but super fun to watch that rise um, on the cookie. Here you guys can see how the feet are forming on the bottom of these macrons as they rise straight up. So that's super fun to be able to see that. They're not spreading out, they're just rising straight up and they just literally pop up like a button. Now these are going to come out of the oven. I'm going to go ahead and take my second cookie sheet and bake those. What's super important here is when you bring them out of the oven is you want to make sure you set them off to the side to cool completely before you ever think of adding the buttercream to them. Um, you want those cookies to be completely cool and that can take anywhere from 30 minutes to a full hour for them to cool. Um, there's no heat coming from them at all to the touch. So again, not hard, it's just a patience thing that we have to wait um, to cool. But that's why I did wanna tell you about the butter. Go ahead and set that out now and you'll have a good amount of time for that to come to room temperature. Measure out your powdered sugar and your caramel. Make sure that um, it's at room temperature as well. You don't wanna use cold ingredients when you're making buttercream. Otherwise, if you've ever made any type of frosting and you have seen it uh, kind of ball up a little bit, that can be because of the temperature of your butter and other ingredients. Um, if you find that your powdered sugar is super lumpy, you can also sift that to make it super fine. Um, you can also run a spoon through there and a fork um, to try to break up any clumps that you have before you mix it up and that way you get a nice smooth buttercream. Um, but have some fun with the flavoring and some colors of these macrons. Uh, you know, the basic measurements of the powdered sugar and the butter are, you know, gonna be in this video and you can start with that. You can add jam, um, strawberry jam to it, 60 grams, and make a strawberry filling. You can add raspberry filling. Uh, I like bone maman jams and you can add that to it and it's delicious. Really, it's up to your imagination what kind of filling you want to add. I just like to add different flavors um, and the longer you let these sit, the more the flavor de develops and the more delicious they are. Um, so as I've repeated over and over again in this uh, video, this is just a patience process type of cookie. And once you master all of this, you'll fall in love with this process and you'll want to make them anytime you have a couple of hours on a weekend or an evening and your family will truly love you for it. <laughs> So you guys can see that my macrons have um, risen. Turn off my timer here. They've risen straight up. I'm trying to tilt it so you guys can see how pretty they are and you can kind of see the rise of the cookie, how it puffed up straight up. And I'm just gonna set these off to the side to cool. grab my next cookie sheet. In the end, I ended up getting about 28 more on this second baking sheet. Um, so we have 98 cookies total. And then you'll divide that in half, which would be around 40, um, let's see, 98 divided by two is four, 18, 48 cookies. Um, out of the deal just by making them one inch. And so I feel like getting the bigger bang for your buck and more cookies is the way to go instead of just 20 some cookies um, of the bigger ones um, because you're gonna want these and you can store them in the refrigerator um, and they just get better and better, like I said. So the cookie sheet is sitting there 
And, you know, again, we're back to that patience process of just letting our cookies cool. I'll be back with you in about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how long these take to cool. And we will make our buttercream up and go ahead and make the filling for our macrons. So we're back now. We've been letting our macrons cool completely. We're now ready to make our flavored buttercream. Like I said before, you can, um, you know, use plain buttercream if you want, which is just sweetened butter. Um, if not, like I said, you can have a ton of fun with flavoring your buttercream to whatever flavor you and your family enjoy. So we have room temperature butter here. It's about 113 grams of butter, um, which is typically one stick. And then you are going to want to measure out, like I told you before, 180 grams of powdered sugar. And we're going to be adding that to our butter. But what we want to do first is make sure that we get a nice consistency with our butter. So we're going to let this go for just a couple of minutes until it's nice and smooth and creamy. And you can turn up your mixture. I don't do it right away, that way I don't have butter flying out at me. Working with soft butter uh, just makes the process a little bit easier. And then you can add in your powdered sugar. You might want to grab a spatula too to help yourself out. That way we don't spill powdered sugar everywhere. There we go. And just be careful as you start up your mixer, go slow and just have it turn a couple of revolutions so you're not, again, splattering powdered sugar everywhere. And this is just gonna look like a big clump here. You can go ahead and add in your salted caramel as well. Scrape, using your spatula, scrape it out of the bowl. try to get every last drop of this caramel out of there. All that yummy, yummy caramel. And I'm going to change my camera view just so you can watch this process so you know what consistency we're looking for. So our caramel has been added. We're, you can see what it looks like right now. And we're just going to turn it on low here let it spin around and I just think it's important to show you guys this process because a lot of people think they've messed up as it clumps together and we're just going to slowly turn up our mixer here so we're at a four right now you can see how it's clumpy and I'm going to turn it up to a six and then I'm going to turn it off and what you'll want to do is grab your spatula and just scrape down the sides of your bowl here. There we go. And go ahead and scrape anything that you see on the bottom. And we'll just take off any extra on our paddle there. And we'll turn it on again here. And what you can see is the batter is now sticking to the edge of the bowl and it's starting to smooth out. And if you look closely at the bottom, you can tell that there's still some powdered sugar down there. So you want to go ahead and grab that spatula 
and scrape down the sides of your bowl and go ahead and push it down into the bottom of any spare powdered sugar that you see at the bottom. So we're just scraping that up and pushing it down to the bottom. And we're gonna try to grab all that extra sugar that is on the bottom there. And again, you just have to be a little patient on this process. And try to incorporate any extra powdered sugar on the very bottom of your bowl into the batter there. Okay, good. And now we'll turn it back on. And again, it's on a two right now. Again, we have just a little bit of powdered sugar there at the bottom. So reach again for your spatula and just push it up into the batter. And again, scrape down the sides of your bowl and try to just scoop up any of that extra powdered sugar at the bottom. If you don't scrape it up, it won't incorporate all of the powdered sugar. It'll end up in the bottom. And eventually all that powdered sugar at the bottom will get mixed in and you'll have a nice smooth batter. So I thought it was important to show you that piece so you guys can see that consistency that we're looking for. So now that you guys can see that consistency that we're looking for, I thought that view would help you a little bit better. Go ahead and grab that spatula again and scrape off as much of that yummy buttercream that you can. Again, today we did the salted caramel buttercream. Oh my gosh, it's so delicious. So, so good but scrape off as much as you possibly can. It's not gonna look like very much buttercream. And I know you guys are gonna think you need more, but you need barely a teaspoon for these one inch macrons, um, one teaspoon of filling. And uh, for the larger macrons, you'll need um, just barely a tablespoon of filling but try to save every little bit you can by scraping off your batter. And then I like to just scrape down the sides of the bowl and get all that batter down into the center. There we go. And you guys can see, it's just gonna look like about a cup of buttercream my hands here. Now you'll want to grab another pastry bag. I have a smaller one here. Um, the one I used earlier was my larger one. And you can place another round tip into the bottom of it. This one has a little bit of a smaller tip. Uh, let's see if I can read the size of this. This one is an 804. And I'm just going to put it into the bottom of my pastry bag. Push it all the way down to the bottom. And then I like to fold back the top. I think I've shared that trick with you guys before. That way you're not getting batter everywhere when you go to close it up. There we go. Now, because this is thick buttercream, the trick of twisting the end we don't need because it's not gonna flow through the bottom. But go ahead and fold back that top and then we will place our thick buttercream into the bag here. And I might have grabbed a little bit too much here. We'll see if we can get this in here with that without making too much of a mess. Gently push down with your spatula so it gets down into the bag. There we go. 
and putting it in that cup just helps you so it's not falling over on you and making that much more of a mess. <coughs> Scrape out your bowl and you can use the sides of your pastry bag to just wipe that buttercream off of there. All right, so grab the edges of your bag and pull up. There we go. And that's just a helpful trick so you don't have buttercream oozing out of your bag. And then just push together the top and you can push it down into the bag and then you're not getting the whole outside of the bag super dirty with buttercream. finger off here. Okay, so what I showed you before, I fold in each side and then make a fold at the top. And then I grab it like this and push it down with my hand so it all goes down to the very bottom of the bag. And you can squeeze with this right hand and you'll see it start to begin to ooze out of the top and then when it does that I just set it right back down set that off to the side and I'm just gonna wash my hands up real quick and then we're gonna grab our cookies go ahead and grab your cooled macrons and if you can't hold the baking sheet it's still warm um, then you know they're not cool um, if you can grab the cookie straight off and it doesn't stick to your parchment paper, you know they're ready. Um, they literally will peel right off. So that's another tip that you know that they're completely cool. And what you're gonna wanna do is, because we're using two cookies, we're trying to match up the same size. So as you pipe these, what you can do is line them up across from another cookie that the, is the exact size that you're looking for. Um, but on your baking sheet, double check that they match up and you can turn the bottom sides upright. So I'm just turning them over so the flat edge is on the top and that's only one half of the cookie that I'm doing that to. And then because our cookies are one inch, they're not very big, we're literally just gonna squeeze a teeny, teeny, tiny bit, a dollop onto the cookie. And again, make sure your top is folded down so that way it's not oozing out. And this buttercream is super thick and you're just gonna put a small dollop right there in the center like this. Grab your top of your cookie and gently press down and it will ooze out right to the edge there and you just have a super pretty cookie and we're going to keep going you press down and again this takes a little bit of time but you just make a small dollop i don't love a t i don't think you need a ton of filling with the sweetened buttercream with the caramel. You don't need a ton. But just a round dollop right in the center. And again, squeeze with your right hand. We're just putting a nice little round circle of buttercream in there. Grab the top of your cookie, add it to the top and just gently push down and then just begin to line up your cookies that have been filled. And then just having this glass nearby to rest your pastry bag in as you go along is super helpful. Give it a squeeze, a round dollop, and we'll just continue on this process of filling armor cron cookies. And this process usually takes me about 15 to 20 minutes or so to fill them all. It takes a little bit of time. 
And you certainly don't have to fill and sandwich each cookie as you go. You can just drop the dollops all along the way and then do it. Um, but I figured this way I can show you what they look like. And I leave a little bit of edge there as I put the dollop on there. That way it's not oozing out the sides when you add the top to it. And see, you just push it down gently and it goes right to the edge. And you just get this darling little cookie. So, so sweet. These really are so fun to make and I truly hope you guys try these and have fun with them. If you have trouble, again, please reach out to me and let me know. There we go. And we'll just keep going along here. I'm not gonna make you wait the full 15 minutes for me to fill all of these. But you guys now have the, the idea of what I'm doing here as I fill these. And what I love is that it's just this really pretty consistency of that buttercream. That's why those measurements were super important. It's pretty thick and your hand could get tired as you're squeezing this buttercream out. But this cookie is just absolutely 100% adorable. Isn't that darling? And I just know you guys are gonna have so much fun with these, playing with the flavors, playing with the intensity of the coloring that you put in these. And they're just super, super fun. As we're you know, gearing up for spring, these are a perfect springtime cookie. Um, if you wanna store these, place them in the refrigerator in an airtight container, and they just get better with time. They are so, so good. Um, the flavor develops and gets even richer. The salted caramel flavor will just pop um, when you try these. Um, I think I'm gonna give this a taste test and see how these are right now. Um, you know, the same day they haven't even developed their full flavor. They just get better, like I said, better and better. Literally soft, pillowy texture, exactly what we wanted. They're not hollowed out in the center at all. And it just melts in your mouth so delicious. I promise if you try this salted caramel filling, you will fall in love. Anyone who tastes these will fall in love. Oh, but my goodness, that's delicious. And you only need one or two. Um, it's just such a fun treat. And all of you who are gluten-free out there, this is a great cookie. Um, all you um, celiac or anyone who, um, is careful with eating gluten um, you can make these cookies up and you'll just fall in love with them so so fun so I just want to say thank you guys for joining today and I really hope you try these and you continue to go share life love and food with all your friends and family thanks everyone we'll see you next time